I'm a fireball. Air crash, Kyle Busch. Kyle Larson. Good morning, everyone, or good afternoon, or good evening, or good March, if you're watching this in March. The 2021 Daytona 500 is in the books, the last one with the Gen 6 car. So that's monumental. I'm pretty happy about that. The first one wasn't that great. And unfortunately, the last one wasn't that great. Two completely different super speedway packages, two completely different scenarios, though. Um, I don't think you can blame the package for the, the, the what is, well, I don't want to say this, the mediocre race that this was. Um, let's get right into it. The biggest thing that happened this race happened early, uh, and it happened before the rain delay, before it turned into a nighttime, you know, midnight Daytona 500. It was the massive wreck that took out 16, 17 cars, a lot of them really quick. Christopher Bell gives a just really hard shove to Eric Amarola way too early in the race, sends Amarola into the wall, collects a ton of cars. Truex, Newman, Kurt Busch, Ryan Blaney, the Bendetto, Bowman, Eric Jones, Tyler Reddick. I mean, these guys are are quick. They're not slow. And uh, they, they, there was a lot of the manufacturer team, like a lot of Fords in there, a lot of Chevys in there, the one lone Toyota of Truex in there. And they're all gone. They're out of the race. And once you go past that, you only have about, what, 20, maybe less than 20 cars that are competitive. I mean, probably around that 15 to 18 area. Uh, and, and so it set the tone for the rest of the race. This is why I like to say that a big one is never good if it happens early in the race. Always, the big one happens, but you want it as a fan neutrally to, you prefer it to happen later in the race, 20 to go, 15 to go, you know, 25 to go, somewhere around that area. So you get the majority of the race with the full pack. And uh, with this current package, having the full pack is a big deal. You can just tell there's a difference between, let's say, the, the shootout races, the dual races, and the 500. We've seen uh, in, in the previous years that the 500 can be really good if you just don't get that big one early on. The big one happens early on, and then the rain delay, you come back from the rain delay, and... Uh, I can't say, I mean, they literally did train the whole entire time. I can't remember a part of the race other than the stage ends where they weren't in a train. Not NASCAR's fault, not even the driver's fault. It's just the nature of what you have to do. You got to tick laps off. It's a 200 lap race. You have the manufacturers working together. It's like a team race. The Fords have a lot of numbers. The Chevys have a lot of numbers. The Chevys aren't as quick as the Fords and and then you get this kind of just everyone sits and waits and waits and waits. Stage one and stage two ended in similar ways. Train, everyone waits. Then it kind of goes a little bit crazy. Now, those were dress rehearsals for the end of the race. And each time in the stages, just for me, I know you don't want to push it uh, at the end of a stage because it's not the end of the race. But this is a dress re rehearsal. It's practice for the end of the race. You know you're probably going to be in a train. And you know if you're running 8th on back, 7th on back, you can't. You simply can't wait till 2 to go. You just can't. And uh, with so little cars in the field and everyone with their own agendas, um, no one was making a move. Now, I will admit, as a fan, this was really frustrating because you're just thinking to yourself, you can't win from back there, so why are you staying in line? There's multiple reasons. Number one, you have to get literally everyone organized around you from seventh on back to go to the bottom and all you have to work together and no one's going to do that because someone from 15th in line can just hop around the top and and pass six cars that way, right? Uh, everyone has their own agenda um, and usually, you know, the top, the top wins because, you know, I guess the, the, the teamwork doesn't work unless it is your own manufacturer or a teammate. Like, you just can't trust anyone else. And, and that's up to the drivers and the teams. And it's it's their fault for, you know, if you're running eighth, you know, like, this, this ain't NASCAR's fault. This ain't the track's fault. It's not the package's fault. It's it's your fault for just not being able to work together and, and get something going on the bottom of the track. And that's why this train happens. Denny Hamlin was stout. Uh, he was one won stage one and stage two. He led the majority of the race, led the most laps. Um, it was the final green flag stop, which... And I feel bad for them. Toyota only had three guys. They had they had what Kyle Busch, they had uh, Denny Hamlin, they had Bubba Wallace. Um, those are the three main guys, and that's it. And so then you go forward with the Penske guys, and then you have uh, front row as well, and and you have uh, uh, some other guys in there. Their numbers are just you know larger than than what Toyota has, and then the Chevys just 
weren't showing up other than Austin Dillon and Chase Elliott. Those two were the only ones that showed anything remotely worth of speed. And then everyone else kind of just, there was nothing. So Denny Hamlin comes down pit road and, you know, the, the Fords did a really good job of faking him out. And there's nothing he can do. <laughs> there's nothing crew chief. I mean, the only thing you can maybe do is pit with the Fords, but then coming out of pit road, they would just train you and pass you. So that that's just a numbers game. There, there's just nothing you can do. I'm going to get to that in a second. Well, not a second. A little bit later in the video. So Denny loses his track position. He goes to the back and he's trying everything he can. No one's going to the bottom. And then it's a train to the end of the race, right? And we're all just kind of waiting. 15 to go, 10 to go, 5 to go. No one's making a move. And this is where I'm, I'm going crazy. I mean... There's around 15 cars in the pack, right? If you are 7th on back, you can't win from that position. You can't. 6th, maybe. I'll give you a chance in case a lot of chaos happens and a wreck happens, right? 7th on back, it's not happening if you're making a move with 2 to go or 1 lap to go. So, in the best interest of everyone, would you think that maybe you should talk to the guys around you and say, Listen guys, we're 7th on back, 7th through 15th. We gotta do something. All of you need to go to the bottom. Every single one. You have to stick together and you got to go to the bottom and you have to make, you have to stir up the pot in order to get going. This, this isn't, if you, for example, if you're running 10th and then you ride the top and you pass those guys, all you're going to do is get yourself from 10th to 7th and then you're going to be stuck there and you're not going to be able to do anything. Third through sixth aren't going to move because they're going to wait until later, later, later. It's the responsibility of the guys in the back. They have to team up. They got to work together. They got to be uh, all in, in cohesion saying, all right, we have to try to make the bottom work. Let's all go at the same time and see what happens. I understand trying to get the run is really difficult. Also, when you're running back there, maybe those guys aren't as quick. But you can't just ride in a line. There has to be something, anything else you can do than ride in a line. You ain't going to go anywhere. So that that's the really frustrating part for me that I just can't fathom to understand. You got to try anything in your power other than running in a line. And that's what they did. They ran in a line until the front guys made a move. And then we get to the package. And and, and what happens is... It, it gonna wreck. So guys start making their moves. Brad Keselowski. And you could, this was really fun to watch. Is that you could see everyone dragging the brake. Everybody was trying to slow down. It was just a, a an accordion effect. Elliot was doing it uh, from Austin Dillon. Keselowski was doing it from uh, Kevin Harvick. And was able to get around Harvick. He had McDowell behind him. And Keselowski gets a push, and Logano's dragging the brake, trying to block his teammate or make sure that the teammate doesn't get a big enough, big enough run. And at this point, you have the drivers in what I like to call the impossible situation for Joey Logano. You see your teammate behind you has a massive run. What do you do? You have three options. You either A, predict the block. If you predict the block, you either get passed on the outside, or you get hit so hard in the rear that you lose control of your car and wreck. You uh, either B, wait for the block to happen and then try to block it, which is what he did in this situation. And with that big of a run, you're going to end up wrecked. Or C, just let him go. And and you lose the race. So it's the impossible situation. There's no other option Logano has. He can't he can't just let him go and, and, and still win the race. It's not going to happen because McDowell is just going to shove Kazowski right through. The run's going to be too big. It's going it, it, to... That's it. So you can't do that. You can't predict the block because you're going to get ramrodded into oblivion and wreck. And you can't block because it's going to be too late. You can't you can't physically time it enough and you and and you're you're not going to be able to do it. As well, Kozlowski tries to do it and he gets rear-ended by McDowell too, who's giving the push. So you're putting the drivers in what I like to call the impossible situation and every single time they're going to wreck and uh, that's what happened and this time they wrecked and it was a a fireball literally. Okay, thank you Pitbull. And Michael McDowell comes along, Brian Vickers style, 2006, you know, Dale Jr., Jimmy Johnson wrecking, and Brian Vickers just shoots right through, and McDowell just shoots right through, <laughs> and the caution comes out, and he wins the Daytona 500, and that's, you know, big props to Michael McDowell, and it's, uh, people, my, some people were like, well, he wrecked Keselowski, and that, that wrecked Logano, and he won the race that way, it's, there, there is no situation where McDowell says, I'm gonna back off here and let Keselowski, you know, give him time, and so, no, no, he has to give the push, it's, it's the... It's what happens with the package that, that we have. This is the last time that we're going to have this package uh, this year. Or not this year. This The remaining of this year. So three more races with this Gen 6 car. And then that's it. You know, the eight years worth of the Gen 6 at plate races. That's done. And I don't know what they're doing with the next gen car, Daytona Talladega. We'll get into that later in the video. But just sticking to the 500. You could see in this situation, there just is nothing to do. A lot of hard, hard hits. Kyle Busch, Logano, Keselowski, uh, Sindrick. A lot of hard, hard hits in this wreck. 
it was right of NASCAR to throw the caution out. At first, I was pissed. I was like, wait a minute. You have 10 seconds until they get to the line. And then I saw the replays and I was like, okay, if I was at the top of the tower and I saw a massive fireball from turn three and four, I would understand the the panic into saying throw the yellow as soon as possible. And that's what they did. They threw the yellow within like a second. And uh, oddly enough, if that didn't happen, you actually would have seen uh, by the way it looked like it was shaping up a three wide uh, finish uh, coming to the line. It was Dylan, Elliot and McDowell all going to be side drafting each other to the line. And uh, one of those guys would have won in a three wide finish. So it would have been crazy, but unfortunately the wreck um, ended up ending the race. And in every conceivable situation you could think of before the race started, this was one of the worst case scenarios. You had a big wreck early on a train for the next 80% or 90% of the race. No one making a move until two to go. And then a race ending under yellow. There is no other way to say that is one of the worst races or one of the worst ways to finish uh, or run a day 2500. It was a horrible race. You don't want to watch that back. Um, there's nothing to watch back. They just logged off laps. You know, the uh, you had a few big wrecks, but overall the race itself was insanely poor. And it's kind of ironic because of the first race of the Gen 6 car in 2013 was horrible. Same training. And 2021, completely different package. But the circumstances that happened... It just all played out to the wrong deck and everything was just wrong. And as a neutral, as a fan, just a really poor Daytona 500. Just really, really poor. Um, I feel bad also for the, what, 30,000 fans that were able to go. It gets rained on. Um, That is not the fans' fault. It's not NASCAR's fault. It's not the team's fault. It's not Steve Phelps' fault as president of that. It's, It's no one's fault other than Fox and NBC who continuously want the later race date because the West Coast has to wake up and watch it in time. It's just uh, it's just ridiculous. I mean, these races should not start at 3 o'clock. Everyone knows it, specifically the ones in Florida. And, and you just, I mean, last season we saw this, I would say, what, 80% of the races were po- delayed by rain or something. It probably will happen this season too. You just can't be starting these races at 3 o'clock. It's just ridiculous. I don't understand what Fox and NBC are seeing. Um, they, they, they ask for this window and next thing you know, every single time delay, delay. Oh, next thing you know, your, your numbers are cut in half because the race is postponed or delayed till, till night. Like this kind of stuff is just ludicrous. Um, I don't know who's in charge of making those calls at Fox and NBC, but they seriously need to look at this and just go back to 1 PM start times. It's, it's, it is not unreasonable to do that i don't see the if you look at the analytics and the stats looking at it i don't think it's that much of a cost to let the west coast have to wake up at 10 a.m and watch a race um instead of letting them wait you know wait till 12 or 1 it it is just inconceivable nowadays it's getting to the point where you are really starting to to basically light a fire in your own product because you know the weather towards three to four o'clock at most of these racetracks it can become very unpredictable. Um, give yourself more time of day to work with if you start the races at one. And uh, I mean, yeah, there, I think even they know it, it. There is no, there's no logical argument you can give us that you can say three o'clock start times are better for the majority of the race races, race teams, everyone. It's not. It's not better at all. It's not better for the fans. It's not better for the race teams. It's not better for the drivers. It's not better for the racetracks. It's only better for one entity, which is the the TV partners which also I don't think it is better for them because they're just going to continuously lose ratings if these races keep getting delayed. So, yeah, that's just a tyrant that I just went on. Before I forget, again, big shout-out to Michael McDowell. He did everything he was supposed to do. It's not a surprise. It really isn't, guys, that Front Row won this race. It's not. Like, Front Row Motorsports, they, they do really well. McDowell is always running up, up there. Um, they've won plate races before. Really good team. Really good team of the plate races. Uh, not a surprise at all, so congrats. McDowell, Elliott, Dillon, Harvick, Hamlin, round out your top five. Priest, Chastain, McMurray, LaJoy, Larson, top ten. Cole Custer, Logano, Kozlowski, but everyone everyone here was involved in the wreck, basically. Uh, Bubba had the, what did Bubba have? Bubba had the loose wheel, actually, on the final pit stop. He was going to get trained anyways and be in the back with Hamlin and those guys, but had the loose wheel, had to come down pit road. So, uh, unfortunate uh, ending for Bubba Wallace, but we'll see how that team goes. They looked really quick. I want to see how they perform at the other tracks. I want to see just how closely affiliated they are with JGR. You know, what 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 will their speed look like? So excited for them. Not a lot of big shout-outs in the results for the top 10. I mean, Corey LaJoy, obviously, that's great. Um, let, let's just 
say it how it is. If you stay out of trouble, you're going to get a good result. <laughs> so Jamie McMurray had a bent-up splitter and everything, was able to stick with the pack, was involved in the first wreck, ended up going in eighth. Ross Chastain with a really good run. Priest, Denny Hamlin's able to maneuver his way through the final wreck, get to fifth. Um, Harvick, Harvick was in a really tough situation because um, he was in that situation where you knew Keselowski wouldn't work with him because Keselowski had, you know, was obviously going to work with Logano and do something for himself. And just like the previous parts of the race, if second place, second place has to make the move quicker. Um, they can't wait till too long because then third will do it and they lose the, the ability to do it. So Harvick probably kicking himself for not being able to, even with four or five to go, just stir the pot up. Just just stir it up. Try to do something to get everyone, the pack, you know, going insane. Um, and, and that would be able to play into your benefit instead of just, you know, waiting. The rest of the results was everyone just train wrecked <laughs> basically from 25th on it was from the first wreck and they went home so truex byron reddick Grala, you know quinn half blaney everyone else they're all done final thing i want to talk about is the next gen car and i had a little idea um and the manufacturers would never agree to this i know this but in, in a in a real world you know not real in a, in a hypothetical world you know where the neutral right fan and racing gets the say I was thinking about this, and I was thinking, like, what the next-gen car is going to do and, and how we can avoid certain circumstances that are happening right now with this current um, this current package. And, and number one is the wrecks. I mean, number one, let's not talk about the entertainment of the race. Let's talk about the wrecks. This is unsustainable. These wrecks um, in these plate races are big, hard hits, fiery. Um, I mean, they are, they're bad. And eventually, I mean, we know Newman got hurt. But I'm talking severely injured. Uh, something will happen. There will be a car flipping into the fence, taking down the fence. A car fully engulfed in flames in the fence, and you know, putting fans in danger. I mean, th this package is too much. It's too much. The runs are too much. Um, the the drivers are put in these weird situations where they either have to take off laps in a train or they wreck. I mean, it's just uh, it's just a little bit too hectic. Now, with the next-gen car, I'm not an advocate of slowing the cars down. I prefer the cars to be around the 190 to 200 range. Um, to be honest, one, if you want to slow the cars down 10 miles per hour, I wouldn't mind that. I think, you know, some of the best plate races we've ever had, the cars are kind of running around that 190 to 195 era, um, or that, that speed era. 200's fine, I don't mind it, but the one thing the next-gen car has to do is, is the runs. And I don't think anyone wants to go back to the bubble era, because that was really frustrating. Um, of the Gen 6 car, but the runs are just too much. They're just a little bit too much. And one thing I was thinking about, you so you have the Fords working together, you have the Chevys working together, you have the Toyotas working together, and I know that they would never agree to this, but for four times throughout a year, for these four plate races, I would really like the next-gen car to be specced out amongst all the manufacturers. And the reason why I say that is because you have to get the front and the rear bumpers aligned for a lot of these guys to be able to to, to trust each other. Now, would they go back to tandem racing? Maybe. Um, but you can kind of get around that by just making the cars overheat really quickly. Um, and I mean really quickly, like within the span of like 30 or 45 seconds, uh, if you tape them up in certain ways. If you get the Fords to align with the Chevys, then they could work together. So one of the things right now is the Chevys can't they, they can't work with a Ford because the nose of the Chevy is different, the aerodynamics, and right now Ford work the best together in terms of manufacturing because their bumpers align, the front and the rear. If you spec everyone out, then you get this situation where you kind of I don't think anyone really likes the manufacturer battles. Like you don't want to see like all the Toyotas working with all, you know, um, and, and then all the Chevys working together and all the four and it becomes this weird, like three team race. You know, it's really odd. If you spec everyone out in terms of just the body, uh, in the alignment of the car, you get really odd situations where like maybe Elliot has to work with Kyle Busch, you know, Kozlowski has to work with, uh, Alex Bowman, you know, Chevy working with a Ford and, and it's because they can work with each other because the, the, the bumpers are aligned and everything. And, Again, the manufacturers never loved this because all the cars would look the same. But for four times a year, I think that would be something. And then whatever the package they want to run with next gen. The runs have to be slowed down. Uh, the speed does not necessarily have to be. I, I think that's okay. Um, but there has to be a point where you got to let them... You got to let the drivers race without the fear of wrecking everything. And, and right now, they are, they are in impossible situations where at the end of these races, 
they're gonna wreck. The first one is the driver's fault. All right, the first one is them pushing too hard. Um, but in the end of race situations, they're gonna wreck. It's gonna be big, and and it's gonna be bad. Newman was bad, but you know, luckily they got away with that. Th- this is becoming a yearly thing in the 500 with a massive wreck, and and so we gotta calm it down. Okay, just just ease it back. Long video. Those are just my thoughts on the 500, guys. Let me know what you think. Um, it in the end, guys, on a scale of one to ten. Five, four. I mean, it's just the situation. It's no one's fault. It, it is just a big wreck on lap 15, and, and the rest of the race just played out like it is. There's just not enough energy in the pack. It's unfortunate. But, you know, objectively, really poor race. Very forgettable. I'm not going to remember this 500. You know, congrats to McDowell, but it's a very forgettable 500. In a few years' time, you guys aren't going to remember this one. You're not going to remember what happened. Subscribe if you're new. Follow me on Twitter and Instagram if you're not already. Uh, and uh, yeah, so I was tweeting a lot yesterday. That was kind of fun to be back. Daytona Road Course next week. I'll watch that one before we head into the kind of part of the season where we're just going through the motion. See who's going to be dominant. That's always nice. Uh, I don't know who's going to be dominant this season. My bet my bet will be Denny Hamlin. I don't know. I'm <laughs> just picking Denny Hamlin. Really good right now. Again, subscribe if you're new. Take care of yourselves. Enjoy the rest of your day. And I will see you guys later. Peace out.